Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us in the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. My name is Vic Pant. I'm the founder, and I'm very pleased to be joined by a noted scholar and eminent researcher with us today in the field of medical biophysics and computer science. Uh, the topic of uh, the talk today is on reducing imprecision in precision medicine. AI is not enough. Uh, very happy to welcome Professor Igor Yurisika to the stream. Uh, welcome, Professor Yurisika. I'd like to start by uh, requesting you to please introduce yourself briefly. Tell us a little bit about your academic journey, your research journey, and then sort of uh, the projects you're working on. And then we can uh, go right into the slides. So the uh, stage is yours, uh, Professor Yurisika. Uh, thank you very much, Vic. And uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to be part of this uh, great uh, group of people that you put together. Uh, so my background is uh, computer science, and I have been kind of initially, I thought that I would be doing artificial intelligence forever, but uh, then I got lurked into uh, computational biology uh, some two decades ago. I uh, moved from University of Toronto and joined uh, University Health Network and specifically Princess Margaret Cancer Center, where I was working on uh, really uh, trying to integrate different kind of algorithms, not just AI, but also graph theory, image analysis, and so on, to solve complex biomedical problems. Um, now we are expanding these into other diseases, including neurodegenerative and arthritis. But the mission is still the same, that uh, one type of algorithm doesn't solve all of the problems. Uh, without good data, doesn't matter how clever algorithm you have, you are not going to get good answers. And the whole aspect is how we, how can we make a better understanding of these complex diseases and help patients. So let me share some of the uh, kind of uh, experiences uh, through through various applications of these technologies into cancer and now, as I said, more recently into arthritis. So what I mean by reducing imprecision in precision medicine is uh, what I will describe next um, is that obviously data is necessary for all of the applications. And being it omics data or clinical data, the challenge is the data has to be of good quality so we can train and validate, for example, artificial intelligence-based systems, machine learning algorithms. Uh, there are many issues that one can go through, technical, ethical, legal, uh, that obviously apply to using AI in medicine. Uh, I will not be going into many of those, uh, but I will focus really on the data aspects. Now, in precision, in data comes for multiple reasons. Uh, one is the data quality, uh, how the samples were collected, how they were processed, what biological assays and what algorithms were used for the analysis. And all of those will introduce some level of imprecision that one has to be careful when you combine uh, these different kinds of data sets or cohorts across uh, many different years. Now, one of the aspects of the biases, obviously, is, as I mentioned, it's uh, how the samples are collected in the first place, but also what is the ground truth? I will be returning to it when I will be talking more about the networks. But a few years back in PNAS, there was an interesting paper that actually identified a large fraction of retracted papers are due to fraud and a smaller fraction is related to mistakes. So this is also very concerning because if you dive further into this paper, it identifies that many of these retracted papers are highly cited. They are from good groups, from good institutions. And so just because it's published in nature science, nature medicine, and so on, doesn't mean that it's correct. But what was more even disturbing is that because of the fraud, uh, some of these uh, retractions uh, take quite a long time to identify. And so, kind of pedestal of evidence-based medicine is that we use past evidences to treat, for example, patients uh, today and tomorrow. The problem is that if the evidence is incorrect, we might be delayed in when we find about the evidence. And so it's important to really deploy strict measures of quality during this process. Otherwise, you might be actually speeding up the process of spreading the inaccuracies from the literature. Uh, this is a cliche statement by now that what is biologically relevant may not be statistically significant and vice versa. So in the same way, one has to approach it with open mind that statistical significance is necessary, rigor is necessary, otherwise we cannot move forward. But one has to be careful also that we have to have something that is biologically meaningful and clinically applicable. Uh, obviously, transfer learning and uh, biases and shifts across the cohorts are known, 
but in medicine, it really has to be uh, taken with uh, additional importance. So for all of these reasons, I feel that we need to have explanation and modeling. So it's not just the fancy thing that ah, hmm, might be interesting, might be useful, but it's necessary because without explanation and modeling, we cannot really increase trust and we cannot really identify what is potentially noise and what is potentially signal. So statistical significance alone is not sufficient. Now, the other aspect I want to highlight is that obviously AI involves some algorithm, but there is data. And importantly, there is a system and how it's going to be used. And I will get to this example sh shortly to really highlight why we had to separate AI into those different components. Now, to further emphasize this issue of retractions is uh, a few years back, we looked into the retractions across the papers. And even if you take into account, obviously, number of papers increasing every year as a denominator, the number of retractions really steeply started to explode in uh, around 2000. We can spend the whole day discussing of why or how and where and so on. Uh, but clearly this relates to a lot of related uh, aspects relate to reduced funding in research, uh, complexity of renewing funds, renewing positions and so on. But also, uh, obviously, a lot of AI and other automated methods have been used to actually detect and identify these retractions. So it's both more is happening, but also we have a better tools of finding it. Uh, regardless to say, well, we are reaching about 8% of retraction a year. So that's a huge number of biomedical literature that we know in maybe a year, maybe in two years, will be removed as inaccurate fraudulent or with mistakes. We have to be careful. Obviously, data-driven medicine uh, has to use that information and we use it on a daily basis. Uh, one example that there are many levels of granularity at which you can find potential errors, potential mistakes, and things to really think hard about how to integrate. So. Uh, this was a collaboration with one of her colleagues from Princess Margaret a few years back, where he had a lot of biological and mouse-related data identifying how RNF8, one of the genes, is important for tumor genesis. The question was, can we help validation on a human samples? Uh, breast cancer, a huge number of samples available, uh, so one can go relatively quickly and identify huge cohorts of patients, run the analysis, and I go back to one of my statements I made earlier that what is statistically significant may be biologically completely useless. So statistically significant difference between expression of RNF8 across large number of patient samples, high expression is bad, low expression is good, but clinically uh, doesn't really separate patients and you can see it on a curve, but if you just look at the numbers, it's a significant result, uh, not useful at all. Well, what is worse is that RNF8 on affymetric chips has two probes. So if you take the average of the two probes, not really anything clinically interesting. If you take one of the probes, oh, the differences are now significantly better, both for all of the samples and also across different uh, histological subtypes. However, if you take the second probe, uh, just the opposite result is true. So high is bad, here high is good. So now the question is, well, if you take the union or kind of the average, it's useless. If you take one or the other, you can kind of pick which one do you like. That's not the right way to go about it. The beauty is that you can take the probe set and identify the sequence that the probe set represents. And luckily, uh, if you do this kind of analysis on a sequence level, then you can identify that the probe set that is the full length protein or, or transcript identification is this one, it's the one, that's the one that actually validates um, the result. So one has to be careful because uh, you can have a paper that just talks about RNFA expression and result. Well, there are two probes and very rarely you will see discussion in the paper that goes on a probe level to identify what really expression of that gene, that transcript means. And obviously, tons of uh, papers across different diseases. So on one side, obviously, AI is great. Uh, and uh, AI has been conquering uh, many different fields. And one would think that 
because of the learning aspect, AI can solve everything and anything to some extent. But again, one has to be careful because we have to train the AI and it has to be validated in order to be useful. Well, validation is incredibly important. The question is though, what is the goal of this validation? And again, staying with the breast cancer, um, now about uh, two years ago, there was an interesting paper in Nature that was validating using a neural network for radiology. <clears throat> now, overall, the paper basically uh, followed very nice workflow. You train the system and you try to try to validate it on a large cohort and ideally across different cohorts. So they picked UK and US cohorts and ran a strong validation. Overall, again, it seems that it's uh, very nice and there are many other uh, important researchers that were suggesting that we don't need radiologists, we can just replace them with the neural network. But one has to be careful of what is our goal? Is it to have a system that is uh, better than uh, uh, mediocre or, or uh, kind of medium level uh, radiologist, or do we want to succeed in a way that it can help expert radiologists to do their job better? So when you look into one of the results from that paper, you can see that actually the, there is a strong difference between UK and US uh, cohort, because the neural network is non-inferior or superior to multiple types of analysis and validation, but it's always superior in a US system. So that always should beg a question, why is that? Uh, and simple answer is that UK system requires two radiologists to agree. And the neural network system is basically similar to that kind of performance. Neural network system is beating US system because there is only one radiologist uh, that is sufficient to make a diagnosis. And so again, one of the goals would be not only to improve the system at the uh, lower level, but to build systems that can help even experts to do their job better, faster, cheaper, easier. And so AI can definitely help in reducing the burden on the number of people, but we can use them as, as a group of experts, as opposed to as a single expert that replaces anybody else. So one of the aspects with this approach is that integrated computational biology can help to answer many of these questions. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have very bad or insufficient uh, collection of samples, annotation of samples, you can disregard anything that will follow. So that's kind of the number one, the biobank where the samples are coming from has to be of high quality. Then obviously there are multiple high throughput platforms, biological assays from mass spectrometry to sequencing to metabolomic analysis and so on, that will provide all of the raw data for linking to the clinical profiles that has to be properly annotated. The analysis then starts, initially you can analyze it on an individual level, but as I will hopefully show you and convince you that these networks of protein interactions, pathways, transcriptional regulatory networks are extremely essential to be able to integrate, analyze, and understand and interpret uh, this complex data. Otherwise, we still will have a problem of what is statistically significant, maybe biologically useless. We will not know what is the noise, what is the signal. We will not know what is potentially correct, what is potentially incorrect, and so on. But at the end, through these models, we then have a chance of uh, actually implementing precision medicine, triaging patients into relevant subgroups, designing better treatments for each of those subgroups, and hopefully driving better outcomes uh, in cancer survival or pain in arthritis or other outcomes, depending on what disease uh, we are trying to improve. So that applies across all of the diseases. Now, one of the challenges is that these relationships, these networks, are essential to be part of this. And obviously the more, more complete or comprehensive they are, the better we can integrate data across uh, different studies, across different modalities, gene, microRNA, protein, metabolite, and so on. So it is important to also ensure that those data is comprehensive, but also there could be errors as well. So it's, it's really uh, multiple chairs where this curation learning, data mining, cleaning, and so on needs to apply. We and others have been working on assembling physical protein interaction. So the way physical uh, proteins can physically interact, it's extremely important because then you can, as again, I will show later, uh, you can 
integrate signal across multiple tissues, across multiple species, and so on. Uh, microRNAs and integration of uh, what genes those microRNAs regulate is also uh, incredibly important because that enables you to link epigenetic signal uh, with transcription, with proteins, with pathways. And obviously pathways uh, are important. There are many different databases and uniting that information with a um, better way of interpreting and, and using this data is essential. Now, at the, I don't have time to go into all of the details, but at the really high level, what this graph shows, what the integration enables you to do. If you consider two largest databases, single databases, KEG and Reactor, all of the light colored signal basically means that for cancer related genes, they do not cover uh, the, the interpretation of the known cancer related genes. If you take integration of uh, multiple pathway databases, including the KEG and Reactome, you can see that the blue line kind of better coverage is significantly increasing. If you include also computational prediction of associations of genes to pathways, uh, you basically have the same coverage as a gene ontology that had been developed over decades of uh, meticulous curation and annotation. And so this basically shows that the single resource will have a lot of the holes. If you start integrating, you can significantly improve on a coverage. But if you include additional steps of machine learning, you can significantly improve. And basically now for the first time, you can reveal what decades of uh, research can be done, has done in, uh, in a different field. So altogether, I mean, it's, it's again, not just for fun or for uh, nice uh, coverage or nice evaluation. I will show you how this kind of data is essential uh, because without it, we cannot create these models and we cannot identify what is useful, what is not, what is signal, what is noise. <clears throat> so once I think, uh, again, AI or machine learning or data mining doesn't really apply only at the high level of how can we separate patients into groups. As I mentioned, we can use that also to identify better ways of these uh, signaling cascades, protein interactions, uh, micro to gene targeting, transcriptional networks, and so on. Again, we have to validate. But the problem with the validation I mentioned also earlier is, well, we validate based on what we think is a gold standard. But in biology, what is a gold standard? Gold standard is something that we believe is true, but it might not be. And again, I will show the example. So this was done a few years back uh, where one of my students was building data mining based approach to predict physical protein interactions. So initially you take the known interacting pairs, those that have been detected by multiple methods across uh, different tissues or, or context, and then likely non-interactions. This is already a first point of, but well, that's why I entered likely because you cannot prove in biology that something doesn't exist just because it was not shown that they interact uh, maybe the right essay or the right biological context has not been used yet. So this is as far as we know so far, uh, in non-interacting pairs. Then you basically use frequent pattern matching to identify a combination of these features without putting any biases or any, any uh, strong preferences of what we think might be true. Just try to go through it systematically to identify which of these combination of these features and values associate more with uh, interacting versus non-interacting pairs. You include information across multiple different types of data, uh, anything that we can get from a sequence, from a structure, from expression data, from uh, conservation across the species, from graph theory of uh, what we know about the connectivity so far, and so on and so forth, uh, gene ontology. And then combining all of these features, we can actually create a probability of how likely the protein is interacting versus not. Now, one of the important aspects is that combining those multiple different features is extremely important because as it shows, each of these features are useful to up to a certain point and then their usefulness basically drops. Pretty much all of the features, some are a little bit better than others, but all of them follow the same principle. If you combine them in a good way, you have this curve that kind of gracefully degrades. And again, I mean, you cannot escape uh, non-knowledge, 
But what is important is that, especially in this part where none of the features alone is really any good, and we are still having a pretty good performance if you combine the little pieces of evidence across a large number of these physical gene ontology annotations and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, the, the proof is in a pudding. How do you validate it? So luckily at the time, there was an interesting paper that was validating multiple biological assays on known protein interactions and known non-interactions. And as you can see, each of these different squares, green one, shows how those different methods were validating known interactions and how many false positives they have or had on the non-interactions. Now, one thing to highlight is five different methods, and you can see that very small fraction of true positives is validated by all of those methods. So this is a, one of the important aspects to highlight because a lot of people, or earlier, many people believe that only interactions that are validated by multiple methods are true. That's definitely not true because we know that these interactions are true, and you can see that large fraction of them are only validated by one method. But what is even more disturbing is that even though you have five biological assays, you still miss 41% of true positives. That's a large number. Now, on top of it, there is about 10% false discovery rate, which is relatively high. Now, the beauty is AI-based method can actually beat it fully. Not only it has a 90% coverage, so much better than 59%, um, but it has a lower false discovery rate than ensemble of these biological assets. You can also show it at a significant level in terms of how much better the prediction is, computational prediction, than these biological assets that are used on a daily basis. So now this is starting to kind of put into question of what is really the gold standard, because we try to validate computational methods by applying them and validating them on what we know. But we kind of can see that these methods are now more sensitive and with less error than the biological assays that we try to use as a gold standard. So we also then validate across a large number of other biological assays, biological uh, data sets, other uh, computational algorithms, and we were able to show the blue line that we are beating it both in terms of precision, uh, uh, precision but also beating it in terms of the lower false discovery rates. Now, one of the things that this kind of highlights is it's, it's tricky to, to train the system on the data that we potentially try to predict. And what we are discovering is that a lot of these predictions are for proteins that do not have many or no interactions at all. So we call them interactomorphins. But what is interesting is that those proteins are a different class of proteins than the rest. Uh, they, are, they have fewer orthologs, they have low disorder, they are short to length, they are usually GPCR, they are poorly characterized, they are expressed uh, across a smaller number of tissues. And so one of the challenges is that while we can predict interactions for some of them, that also highlights the fact that we have to develop a better methods because we can improve predictions for more of them if we can adapt those learning uh, data sets and training data sets towards the different class of proteins where we try to predict, not just globally. Now, even with this though, uh, this was done uh, in 2015 and there are many other uh, tr uh, machine learning algorithms that have been published since then or uh, uh, earlier. And now we have 2022. So what is interesting is that obviously all of those algorithms were predicting certain interactions. Fraction of those we were able to validate because either uh, we generated new data or retrospectively validating on some uh, independent data sets. However, there were always interactions that were basically predicted, but we could not validate at that time. Well, a lot have happened in biological experiments since then. And what is really nice to see that large fraction of those interactions are still on a year-to-year -year basis validated, which means that in 2015, we would call them false positives because we predicted any interactions and we did not have evidence for the interactions. In 2022, almost 7% of those have been now validated. So we have to, again, reassess 
how likely it is our false positives are true false positives, or potentially they are just waiting to be validated in the future. <clears throat> so where and why this kind of information is necessary? So this example is now in ovarian cancer. Uh, P53 is one of the genes that is mutated in virtually all high-grade series ovarian cancers. If you look though, using statistics of if the type of mutation relates to the outcome, nothing can be found. If you take a histochemistry that is available for every patient that goes to the clinic, you can identify through clustering, uh, in this uh, case, cell organizing maps, you can identify four clusters that actually show one of the clusters shows a significantly worse survival than the other three. Now that opens a possibility because we can now look into what are the mutations across these four clusters, and especially what are the mutations that differentiates the low survival cluster from the other three. So all of these numbers, the bigger they are, the more prevalent that specific P53 mutation is in the cohort of patients. Now, why it is important is that not only we can then link those mutations to specific molecules, but also we can identify if that interaction, physical interactions is potentially relevant in ovaries, in ovarian cancer, uh, based on a sequence or based on a, uh, I mean, a transcript or based on a protein expression. But also importantly, if we have any knowledge, and this comes from a curation and annotation of physical protein interactions, that that interaction is affected by the mutation of P53. And there are interactions highlighted in red that are disrupting the interactions or increasing the interactions or reducing the interaction. Now, why is this important is that while uh, there are many molecules that are potentially affected, the BCL2 complex, uh, large number of interactions, is potentially affected. And why it's important is that BCL2 complex have been shown if inactivated, those patients do not respond to the chemotherapy. And now that starts to make a little bit of a sense because this mutation is in patients that have a worse survival. Well, if they don't respond to the chemotherapy, that would be one of the reasons why they have a lower survival. So expanding this information, this is still an ongoing project with European Bioinformatic Institute, is to really dissect of how these, these uh, individual mutations affect interactions and how those potentially can implicate, model, and help to interpret uh, the results. And so if you think of it, again, number of genes, number of proteins within a given disease, number of mutations that cancer patients have, this is just P53 mutation, and it shows how strongly one can use that information to predict uh, potentially which patients will or will not respond to the treatment and why. And obviously, this is just opening the, the possibilities of trying to find, is there anything pharmaceutically or otherwise we can do in order to repair those networks and make those patients respond? But the other thing, the other example I wanted to use for how these networks are essential comes from integrating even more types of data. And so this uh, started really as a work in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, and a uh, large number also on transcriptional profiles, uh, RACGH data on chromosomal aberrations, large number of uh, microRNA data sets that show how those uh, microRNAs potentially are deregulated. But the traditional approach is that people would look into the chromosomal aberration, amplification or deletion, and try to identify genes that are overexpressed on amplified regions, repressed on uh, deleted regions, which kind of makes sense. Uh, virtually in any data set, this is in line, but you can go across different other uh, tumors or other uh, diseases, you will find that virtually everywhere you will find paradoxes. It's a deleted region, but the gene is overexpressed. And pretty much everywhere people this, the, uh, remove it as potential noise because it doesn't make sense. If the region is deleted, then the transcript should not be activated. So what we pose the question uh, is that, well, can we explain those paradoxes? And at least some of them maybe uh, there is a reason, explanatory reason why they have this aberrant expression. 
The way to do it is to identify for the deregulated microRNAs, what are the gene targets and are they directly related in the direction that we would predict. And so all of the edges basically represent relationship between the microRNA and the gene, but we highlight with the red edges, solid edges, those that have potentially explanatory relationship. So the microRNA is downregulated, but the gene is upregulated. Now, this is going across different patients, different data sets. And so one can say, well, an interesting model, but it may not be true. It might be just an artifact. So what is important is that in cancer, we have the Cancer Genome Atlas created by NIH over uh, 33 different cancer types. And the beauty is that all of these different measurements are on every single patient. What is interesting is that 70 of the 85 identified genes, those paradoxes, have been validated on the TCGA, completely different cohort, and now validated in a given patient, all of those different measurements. What is even more important is that almost 66% of those paradoxical genes are validated as being deregulated through the microRNAs in the same way. And significantly large number of these microRNAs have been identified as explaining this deregulation. So going further on a TCGA, we can explain the model that not only this is plausible from kind of modeling viewpoint, modeling the biology, but it makes sense from explanatory mechanism in terms of the signal that we are detecting. And it's almost all of them. Now, that may be still interesting, but the biggest question is, is it clinically relevant, not just interesting biological model? And so we took different set, again, of uh, patient samples across uh, three different cohorts, and we're able to identify that large fraction of these genes are not only interesting as paradoxes that we can explain through the epigenetic mechanism, but they are also significantly related to survival. So a signal that would get rejected as potential noise, we actually can prove that 60% of it is not only biologically explainable, but significant to survival. And so pointing to the area of importance and the networks enable you to answer what is right, what is wrong, what is significant and clinically and biologically relevant and what is potentially noise. So going through it, uh, this example is from arthritis. Uh, you can really start building this kind of network models of signal from your own data with all of the other published data and put it into concerted explainable models that can actually run inference. Now, to order to do it in a given disease, you have to do curation uh, because as I was mentioning earlier, a lot of uh, garbage uh, basically can make all of these analyses very unstable. So it takes some time. And as you can see, for example, in osteoarthritis, we went through over a thousand papers but we ended up with only 63 collected data sets. And there are multiple reasons for rejecting it. Uh, in the paper, we go through all of the attrition rate, which could be that the data is not original, data is not uh, properly um, available, data potentially is not properly annotated, and so forth. And so forth. Um, but once you have that, you can start generating models and explainable uh, inferences even beyond what your data enables. So this was focusing mostly on transcripts, on gene expression, but we had another curation study that was looking at the microRNAs. Now you can combine the two and identify which microRNAs are destructive for the joint, which are protective to the joint, and how that relates to the gene expression uh, in terms of what we know. And again, similar example as uh, I was showing on, on paradoxes, but now basically combine, you, you don't need to do all of the profiling all of the time. You can nicely combine existing data with this, uh, with this network approach. So kind of high level analysis from it is that we combine this data into a large portal database where we have a lot of clinical information, uh, a lot of biological profiles, and we can easily identify multiple things. Not only what are the up and down regulated genes, for example, but also, as you see these three different uh, columns, it identifies which of these genes are 
most frequently up or down regulated across the existing studies, but also how was that information changed as we were going through the curation process? So in a sense, different versions of the database or portal. And what is important to see is that main genes are not really changing. So as we are adding more and more data sets, we are not changing which genes are important or not, which means that we are somehow finding something that is relevant to the disease overall, because as soon as we would add a data set and we will have completely different results that suggest that we are still far from uh, understanding the disease in general. You can then take those genes and for example, run pathway enrichment analysis and identify which pathways are important for up or down regulated genes. Not uh, surprisingly, we are identifying that a lot of uh, adhesion molecules, integrins are important because we are dealing with a joint. But what is also important is that metabolism and fatty acid metabolism is extremely important. Now, this is also important in osteoarthritis because obesity is a risk factor. And the question is, is the patient having problem with the joints mostly because of the weight related to obesity? Or are there uh, basically mechanisms of uh, fatty acid metabolism that actually help destruction of uh, the joint? And so that's critically important to understand because that can lead to identifying better ways of treating patients. Um, I will skip through some of these examples, but what is important is that we can take the up and down regulated genes and their frequency. And based on that, we can use transcriptional profiles of FDA approved drugs to identify which drugs potentially can work for treating or reversing uh, this, this uh, expression profile. And what is interesting is that when we zoomed in on a top 10 drugs that we predicted through this uh, kind of de novo data-driven analysis, five of those drugs already have some evidence in uh, preclinical trials, both on model organisms and human. But what was more interesting is that, so in a sense, it's kind of more than 50% validation that our predictions are reasonable because those drugs have been uh, already providing some evidence in preclinical studies of their benefit to treating arthritis, osteoarthritis. But what is more interesting is that then we have two drugs that not only we have a mechanism of how they likely work and why they should work, but also we can identify through these networks what are the surrogate markers that we can use to measure response to the drug. So we don't need to wait a year or so to see if the patient is improving. We can measure the surrogate molecules and identify if the patient is non-responding earlier. And that's obviously uh, change and improve uh, the outcomes. Now I will switch gears a little bit because while I was focusing a lot on how this molecular medicine in a sense can work and why it does work in this way, uh, I wanna show also one example of how can it still help uh, with uh, clinical information alone and how then we can combine the two pieces together in order to really truly benefit the patients. And again, what are the caveats of using AI? So in this case, this is uh, focusing on a lower back pain uh, progr program and, and problem in, in arthritis. And we had a relatively large data set uh, used for training and completely independent uh, large data sets used for validation. In uh, lower back pain, uh, there are multiple measures and outcomes that relate to pain how uh, painful it is for patients to do their daily life or to work and how much this disability uh, influences uh, their quality of life. What we wanted to is uh, to combine multiple characteristics uh, of clinical information that is collected on each patient and see if we can build either individual or an ensemble of classifiers that potentially would enable to triage patients into relevant subgroups and improve the way patients can be treated with lower back pain. Now, as I said, we have uh, relatively good training and validation sets. And through relatively straightforward analysis, we were able to get relatively decent uh, performance. But one has to carefully examine at the lower granularity how this works, because 23 patients, 23% 23 of the patients were incorrectly predicted by the ensemble. So overall, it's not bad, but obviously as a patient, I would not really care if it's 83 or 93%. I wanna know how accurately my specific case can be identified. And also based on that, 
what would be the suggestions as a treatment? So one has to look at the lower level on a patient level, what can we learn from this kind of analysis, training and validation? And so one of the interesting thing is that all of the classifiers failed on, well, only 11 patients, but 11 patients is still a large number. What is also interesting is that 54 patients were perfectly classified by all of the classifiers. So if you look into what is strongly correct, all of the classifiers uh, agreed or strongly wrong and anything in between, it really opens that we need to kind of dissect it a little bit more. And so I used so far these networks and the software that we we'll developed for analyzing and visualizing the networks, mostly for signaling cascades, protein interactions, microantigen targeting, and so on. But in this case, the nodes in the network are patients and the edge represents the similarity of the patient. So it's an outcome of this ensemble approach. And now you have to pay attention to the color, not only of the edge, which the stronger color means stronger or higher similarity, but the triangles represent known cases. So in a sense, your evidence from the past uh, database. Now, circles represent the patients that we want to try to treat or predict the treatment for. And what is important is to look into the inside color, which is the true label, and the outside color, which is the prediction. So as soon as you can see that the circle is basically just red or just green, that means that both the prediction and the true label for the patient are in full agreement. If you see something that is a dual color circle, that means that I, the prediction doesn't agree with uh, the true label. And you have both cases that the uh, true label is, uh, doesn't improve, but we were predicting improvement and vice versa. So when you look at it at a high level, uh, there are a few things that one can discern from these graphs. One is that you see green associated with green more often and red with red in strongly correct which makes sense because we try to evidence-based medicine. We try to predict what this patient will do based on a similarity to other patients, like in case-based reasoning or analogy-based reasoning. Uh, but you can also see that there are these islands, which basically suggest that this is probably a good cohort uh, representation versus here are singular exemplary patients. And we have to be careful because there is very little evidence we, we have on those there is plenty of evidence we have around here. So in a get-go, you already know how much confidence you potentially have on uh, providing the insight from this kind of analysis. When we move into the weak and undecided, uh, you can see that it's a lot more kind of colorful because uh, there is mix and match. Also, you can see that no longer it is uh, very nice, uh, large connected components. There is a lot of these connections in the graph. So again, very useful because we need to know how confident this kind of analysis is on a patient level. Well, when we go into wrong and strongly wrong, now this is uh, important to kind of stop and further dive into. And one of the reason is that, okay, we, for example, take this uh, patient sample. The patient did not improve, but we were predicting that the patient would improve. We were wrong. But you look into what are the similar patients and all of them are improved. So AI or human expert looking at this case, there is no way you would predict that patient doesn't improve because everything points to the improvement. So now the question is, why did the patient did not improve? And that requires obviously going uh, deeper because there might be aspects of the lifestyle, there might be aspects of no compliance to the treatment and so on and so forth. Uh, relatively small number of patients, but we need to uh, dig into this a little bit further. Now, again, important aspect is that overall performance is interesting, but really the, the most interesting questions come when you dive into the granularity of individual patients and causes and, and uh, 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 information that we have available about why and how. So modeling it, not just predicting it. So to, to kind of finalize, what I would like to highlight is that we really need, uh, AI is helpful, but we need real intelligence because if we are going to blindly use it, uh, we are not going to get the best out of what this technology can provide in uh, healthcare. Building the models is also important because eventually we may get to better understanding how to prevent the disease, which obviously should be the goal. 
I don't want to have a great diagnostic system that, oh yeah, once you develop cancer, I will be able to see it and maybe I will be able to treat it. Is there anything I can do to prevent that to even happen? But obviously we cannot prevent everything. So important way is to have a diagnostic, prognostic and predictive biomarkers or signatures that can help to identify the disease early. And we have to have a different modalities for the treatment and repairing the networks. So again, all of it points to just molecular profiles or clinical information can point to some, some directions, but it's really the networks that will help us to repair and identify new treatments and repair what really is wrong. Throughout, hopefully I showed uh, good examples of showing that, that uh, data availability, but importantly, quality and annotation is important be it clinical, be it molecular profiles, but importantly also pathways, interactions, and so on, that basically provide these relationships or glue among those individual pieces. And because of uh, kind of uncertainty in terms of uh, where is the data coming from, is it correct or not, uh, was everything done properly, one has to really test and train and validate often and continuously, because just because one can identify what worked two years from now, 10 years from now, or in South America, instead of North America or in Europe or in Asia, there are going to be differences that we need to be able to resolve. We cannot just uh, take it for granted that this was validated system and now can just be used. So to finish, I would like to thank uh, multiple collaborators across uh, different disease types um, and, uh, and uh, kind of analysis of, uh, of different diseases, because all of those contributed in some way to harnessing different and better understanding of how this could or should work, what are the features that we are missing or can we act, implement more, and multiple funding agencies across the year that helped uh, develop these tools and resources. Obviously, large uh, thank to the group members that uh, were working on those individual analyses, individual tools, and that ensure that our systems are up and running. Uh, you can find more information on the webpage and also on the World Community Grid for some other related analysis. Uh, thank you for attention, and I would be happy to answer if there are any uh, questions. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, uh, Igor, for a great presentation. Uh, lots and lots of ground covered with uh, so much depth and yet so much uh, so accessible. So uh, perhaps in the interest of time, I can ask you one question and then we can wrap up. So the question is, uh, you know, you showed those um, you, you showed this network diagram and essentially you said that uh, in one case, each of the nodes represented an individual and then the uh, edges represented the uh, similarity between the individuals. Uh, that's very interesting. So one question I want to ask you is, do you uh, there's a lot of concern around privacy there's a lot of concern around pii especially as it relates to healthcare data and there's quite a few of these genetic screening services now where you can mail in your saliva sample or a swab and then they do your full entire uh, profile whether it's ancestral ancestral profiling or whether it's some kind of pharmacological uh, pharmacological interaction profiling so when you build these similarity uh, calculate the similarity metrics. Are you considering some of those PII or are you uh, putting some filters or are you completely not considering what would be considered PII? Uh, so in this specific case, uh, this was still done uh, behind the firewall in a hospital setting. And so we was using all of the private information, but in a, in a safe setting of the hospital. If you would wanna share this kind of information across different jurisdictions, then you would need to obviously pay attention that uh, sometimes you cannot. You, you would not even have access to that information, so uh, that that would be trickier how to, how to implement it, and in a sense would require a different kind of solution. So this is still on a single site, single cohort uh, study. Okay, that's great. Maybe one more question, uh, uh, Igor, if I may. And you talked about uh, the kind of the notion that there's many different algorithms which can be applied to solve these kinds of problems. And then at the same time, you're also building ensembles of models that are generated through different algorithms and different hyperparameter combinations. So how important is explainability and interpretability of these models to you, given that in some cases, some may be more opaque and others may be more transparent? Um, well, so, I mean, you can again take it at the different level of uh, explainability on individual algorithm level or explainability on the ensemble level. 
And I think uh, the important aspect is that as humans, uh, we can learn, obviously, and we can teach these algorithms based on both successes and failures. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to identify. And uh, again, I mean, one of the aspects I was highlighting is that, for example, in protein interactions, right, uh, in order to validate what is a success and what is a failure, we use existing data. But as I was showing, well, existing data has also false negatives. And so what we think is our false positive could be true positive, and we actually could do a disservice if we try to adjust the algorithm to predict it in a different way to reduce number of false positives because there might be true positives. And so one of the reasons for this explainability is that we can then uh, study what is likely cause of potential uh, false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives, and try to study it further and maybe run additional validations with uh, different biological assay or with different algorithms to see, is it kind of trying to discern what is potentially noise, what is true, what is not. And uh, really in, in biology and medicine, we are still striving. I don't want to say that we have only not gold standards, maybe wooden standards or <laughs> or rock standards. And we need to try to get into the bronze and silver before we can say, oh, now we have a gold standard. Uh, one other uh, kind of aspect with these multiple methods, in a, again, kind of similar to these biological assays, you have five biological assays and each of them have different biases. They work for some, they don't work for the other. So even the union is giving you more than uh, than a, any single algorithm, but the same for the machine learning, that there are different principles of how they work. Um, sometimes it might be useful to say all of them agree because that's then strong predictions. But even if one of the algorithms is identifying, for example, patient with cancer, it's probably worthwhile to take it uh, further and identify if it's potentially true or false. Very so diversity, I think, helps in, in multiple different ways. Absolutely. That's that's wonderful, Igor. Uh, and throughout your talk, you touched on uh, next steps, you touched on future directions. So on behalf of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum, I really appreciate uh, your coming back to share your uh, future insights and further uh, foresight with us in, in, in the next coming months. Uh, the field is advancing so rapidly, as you showed us, and uh, you talked about retraction of papers and how, uh, you know, things are coming out very, very quickly. So happy to have uh, request you to come back in a few months and share some new updates from the field. But until then, thank you so much on behalf of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum, and we'll see you again soon. Thank, Thank you, you very much again for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you.